extra protein doesn't necessarily cause a problem. Extra protein, A, takes more calories to burn, so you actually can end up in more of a deficit that way by eating protein calories versus fat calories, but B, gluconeogenesis does not kick you out of keto unless you are consuming an acutely huge amount. Um, in fact, it can actually support it and stabilize it. Thomas DeLauer, welcome to the Keto Camp Podcast, my brother. Hey, thanks for having me, my man. Yeah, I'm so excited to chat with you. You are, I, I consider you a legend in the keto, fasting, and in inflammation space. And you have an amazing story that I'd love for you to share, how you went from being an obese man who's lost in life, chasing the coin is what you said, to what you're doing now, living on purpose, on purpose, and you look super healthy, super fit. So share your story with us, brother. Yeah, for sure. I'll give you kind of a little bit of the abbreviated version so I don't take up a half an hour with it. But, um, you know, the long and the short of it was I was – an athlete in high school, not necessarily a health conscious athlete, but you know, I ran track, ran cross country, or played rugby. And, and you know, so I kind of came from the school of thought that, okay, if I'm active, then I don't really need to pay attention to my diet as much, which is the thought process for a lot of people. So then, you know, get out of school, get into the corporate world. And, you know, I had already had some injuries from playing rugby and things like that, that made me a little bit more inclined to be sedentary and just, just to, you know, pain of avoidance really. But then ultimately what started happening was, okay, I got focused on my career, focused on making money, and I was living a sedentary, high-stress lifestyle in a corporate setting, and ultimately still eating like I was an athlete. That's really what it came down to. And although, yes, I, you know, I had some muscle mass on me from you know, years of, of weight training in, in high school and college and things like that, but the reality was is like, it doesn't matter if you're eating like garbage and you're high stress and your cortisol levels are through the roof, the weight just piles on and you're somewhat genetically predisposed to that to some degree. So I think I just, you know, the cards were stacked against me in that respect. So then as uh, time went on, it didn't take but a couple of years for me to really pack on over 100 pounds. And I was sitting close to 290 pounds when I was at my heaviest. And there was no real solid call to action. Like I didn't wake up one day and say, oh my gosh, and look in the mirror and see like, oh my gosh, I'm obese, I need to lose weight. It was kind of uh, this, you know, slow effect. It was kind of people would say these comments or people would, you know, I'd notice things. I'd notice my performance decreasing in, in just mentally. And then finally, it just accumulated to the point where I'm like, wait a minute. All right. Yeah, something needs to change. But a lot of it came from a self-experimentation piece, which is always how my brain has worked. And it's carried over to what I do today. So what started as um, an experiment on myself being like, hey, I hear all these doctors that I work with always talking about inflammation. They're always talking to me about my health and inflammation. Let me pivot some things and do some experimentation on myself with sort of the guidance of some of these doctors and see what happens. And so it started with me just kind of eliminating some, what were noted as like inflammatory foods. Like one of the foods that I got out of my diet at the, at the first point in time where it was gluten and like just getting gluten out of my diet alone, I dropped like 11 pounds and it was just like, okay, something's going on here. And it was at that moment when it clicked when getting gluten out of my diet made a big shift in my weight, not just with water, but seemingly with fat too, that's when it was like, wait, there's something to this. Cause I didn't really change my caloric intake. <laughs> like I just changed one big thing. So that is when like the light bulb went off and the self-experimentation bio-individuality aspect of like who I am was just like, we gotta, we gotta explore this. And that's the next step after that was actually implementing intermittent fasting and then keto after that. But it was pretty short, you know, a little stint of intermittent fasting without keto. Uh, yeah. And then lost about a hundred pounds, a little over a hundred pounds in just over a year. And then it kind of turned into a personal mission. It was like, okay, I, I lost all this weight. Um, I was looking pretty good, but I wanted to take a little bit further. I said, okay, to my wife, I, I kind of want to see if I can push myself to get on the covers of some magazines and do what I could do. And during that time frame of losing weight, I actually stepped out of my corporate role. The company had gone through an acquisition, so I was able to step away at a pretty convenient time and say, okay, I'm going to move on and do something different. And I didn't know what I wanted to do. Uh, I thought that I wanted to be into the fitness industry. And it happens with a lot of people, like when they first lose a lot of weight, they get kind of this newfound fitness and you suddenly want to do something with it. And that's kind of what happened to me. I lost a lot of weight, I wanted to do something with it. So I jumped into the, the fitness, even kind of the bodybuilding community for a little bit because it seemed fun. And I knew that I had the business acumen to be able to talk with um, 
the editors and magazines and be able to get, do something with my transformation because I'm like, okay, I know how to contact these people. I spent years as a recruiter. So I knew how to like get behind the scenes and talk to the right people. You know, it's what I did for a living. And, uh, so that's how that came to be. It was like, well, your story is amazing. Let's get you on the cover of some magazines. So then I had the mainstream media exposure to kind of bring me up in the fitness industry, but it didn't take me long to realize that the fitness industry wasn't what I liked. It wasn't what I was after because the fitness industry was really just cosmetic and it was all about like how you look. And I'm like, well, there's so much more to this. Like that's you like how you look is just a rough, should be just a reflection of what's going on on the inside. And as you probably know, Ben, like the, the fitness community, there's a lot of people that look great, but their insides are probably rotting, right? It's uh, you know, you can do some stuff in the short term to make yourself look good, but it's not exactly. So I said, okay, it's my mission to bridge the gap between health and fitness. And with that, I was able to kind of leverage the fitness exposure that I had. The fitness industry dropped me like a hot potato because suddenly I wasn't talking about fluorescent supplements and what they wanted to hear. So it was kind of like abandonment, like fitness industry. Okay. They're like, see you later, Thomas. Like, you're not our style, man. You're talking about eating healthy. You're talking about keto. Like, I mean, I'm happy to say that they dropped me and they were, they didn't give two cares. And I'm like, okay, I'm on my own. Like, here we go. Let's do this. So that's how I started the channel. I'm just like, okay, I can't, I can't rely on the fitness industry. They're not going to make my career for me. I'm just do it myself. Um, and it was, you know, six months of battle grind. No one wanted to hear what I had to say because I was just a, you know, oh, look, he's just, you know, I don't want to listen to some dude with a six pack talk. And then finally people were like, oh, wait a minute. He's actually speaking with some true legitimate science and he's actually explaining complex subject matter. And that's when I realized that my gift was being able to articulate complex subject matter. And so the brand was built and that's it. Amazing. What a, what a story, you know, you, you condensed it for sure. And, it, and there's a lot more details to it. Well, I want to know what made you choose out of all the platforms out there, you could have gotten the message out there. What made you choose YouTube? Uh, well, you know, I actually, believe it or not, I started on Facebook um, and Facebook grew pretty rapidly, but it was right when it was actually out of frustration. And this is purely technical, I guess you know, when Facebook was the first one to really change the algorithm to make it so difficult for people to really get heard. And I knew that um, what I was saying had a lot of power. And it was like, I was, it was amplified. And then suddenly algorithms changed on Facebook. And it was like, it wasn't able to reach my audience as much anymore. And I'm like, you know what, at least YouTube is evergreen. For me, I know that if I put a video out on YouTube, and it's informational, people will be able to find it for years. And I wanted that legacy with it. I didn't want, you know, so it's like, I consider it legacy content when it goes up there and people can watch it. Like some of my best performing videos are videos that are two, three years old because they just keep going. But then when you look at, um, Facebook is awesome, but it's quick impact. So now it just made me decide, okay, for what I'm after, YouTube's going to be my platform because it's going to allow people to really want to get educated to find what they want to find. So six months in, you were not really getting the views you wanted, not the traction you wanted. What made you, how did you keep going? Two months in, three months in, you're just seeing, hearing crickets. What made you keep going? That's a good question. Um, you know, I didn't even really think about it at that point in time. I think I was just so focused on the outbound, so focused on just creating the content because it felt good for me to get it out anyway. Um, and I had so much to say that people, anyone that watches my videos will be like, Thomas, shut up already. Like you're talking, to, talking too much, if anything. So I had so much information I wanted to get out. And so for me, it was, it was actually easy to keep, get that content going. And I wasn't expecting, like my expectations weren't high. I wasn't sitting there thinking like, I'm going to make this massive brand and get rich on YouTube. It was kind of like, if people want to see my content, they'll see my content. And it was just doing it because I wanted to. And it started out with me referring friends to my videos because it was easier to send them to a video than it was to sit down and try to explain to them for 30 minutes. I'm like, well, I have a well-crafted video that explains this with visuals probably better than I could do right now. So, and then I think just that honesty and authenticity is what allowed it to, to really grow. Awesome. Yeah, I'm a big fan of your channel. Uh, every, anybody listening or watching needs to be subscribed to Thomas DeLauer's YouTube channel. It's a wealth of information. And like you said, it's evergreen. You can search for whatever you need. You have a, a video on pretty much every topic or question out there, especially when it, in regards to keto, fasting, and performance. Um, so you had mentioned a few things. You said inflammation was key, bringing down inflammation. You reduced, you got gluten out of the body, and you lost 11 pounds just from doing that. A lot of people, they don't really understand how that can be because they a lot of people are still fixated on the calories in calories out approach i talk a lot about inflammation as well and when when i refer to inflammation i'm talking about cellular inflammation right Re yeah. inflammation around the receptor sites when our fat burning hormones all of a sudden can't get in 
if you can't fix the cell, you, you won't get well. So what are some other ways inflammation, having too much inflammation leads to weight gain and or weight loss resistance? Yeah, I mean, I'd say the simplest one that comes to mind, it, well, like you said, you know, the receptor cell, when that's foggy, for essence, in essence, like it, things can't bind, LDL can't bind, all these, that's when, it, that, that's why it becomes, they call it the root of disease, right? The root of metabolic disease, because like when things can't, if you take a ship that is trying to dock into a dock, docking station, and that dock, for whatever reason, is closed, and that ship can't dock, then that ship can't unload its nutrients. It can't unload what it can't do what it's supposed to do. And that's effectively what's happening. The receptor sites, our docks are closed. And it's that's a big problem because then LDL and chemicals and everything will just pool up in your blood and cause further inflammation and further issues. But I think the simplest one that was explained to me the first is is within our gut. Um, you know, our gut is a very fragile little ecosystem in and of itself. Okay. You've got the microbiome, sure, but then you've got uh, all the enterocytes, you've got different cells that live in your gut. And you've got, of course, different minerals. You've got chelation of different, anyway, point is the gut is amazing. But on the outsides of our, of, of some of our cells and then our gut, we have lipopolysaccharides, or sorry, in the bacteria, the gram negative bacteria, we have what's called lipopolysaccharides. When they're in their own little ecosystem, they're fine. But when these lipopolysaccharides get into the bloodstream, they cause a world of hurt because they're not supposed to be there. And if you heard the term leaky gut before, then you kind of know what I'm talking about. But the hard part is, is that leaky gut has been pushed in such an over-marketed gimmicky way that people tune it out. But it is 100% a real thing, and it is probably the easiest explanation of inflammation. When you are inflamed, your gut cells like and your actual intestinal lumen will become inflamed. And what happens then is it becomes weak and it becomes disrupted and it allows those lipopolysaccharides that should be contained in our gut to leak into the bloodstream and they just run amok causing all kinds of damage within the body. They can damage the blood-brain barrier. They could damage our glu uh, glucose receptors. So then all of a sudden you've got these little, little just suckers just running amok and they're blocking your ability to process glucose to the extent that you should. They're blocking all these different things, which therefore leads to insulin resistance, which leads to weight gain, which that's just one example. Okay? Then you think about, I mean, I think a lot of our inflammation is rooted there, but a lot of our inflammation is also just rooted just in our stress levels in general. And people will think, okay, you can change a lot with your diet, but you can change more with your lifestyle and just your overall stress levels. And you know, which came first, the chicken or the egg? That's a question that anyone will ask. Um, point is, is, for me, with gluten, I was clearly having some kind of cross-contamination with or cross-reaction with gluten to the point where it was causing me to have some kind of intestinal inflammation because it doesn't digest well. I was clearly having lipopolysaccharides that were leaking in, clearly running amok within my body. And the reason I, this at least my hypothesis, the reason that I lost weight so quickly when I at least got rid of gluten was probably because my cells were able to operate more efficiently. And suddenly the protein that I was consuming was actually going through proper protein synthesis and wasn't just, you know, getting passed through me. My body was actually able to utilize things. I hope that that kind of makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. It does, it does make sense. So gluten is one of the main culprits for not just you, a lot of people out there who don't even realize that they have a sensitivity or even worse, a, a, a allergic reaction to it. What are some other main things you've seen that cause a, a leaky gut, poking holes in somebody's gut? What are some other sources out there? Yeah, well, it's going to depend to, on a lot of people because they're going to have different reactions, like, right? There's always going to be different immunoglobulins and different IgG, IgA res, uh, responses to things. But I would say uh, for a lot of people, dairy, you know, it all depends. Again, sometimes you have to build up a tolerance, but uh, grains in general, there's different cross contaminants and there's different things called prolamins where sort of the enzymes and the proteins kind of cross over from what's, what gluten is as well. So that's that's a big one. Uh, we're starting to see, unfortunately, we're starting to see like even tapioca start just causing a lot of resistance with people because it's overused. The point is, is that anytime you consume something so much, like in the case of gluten, it's in everything, um, and wheat was in everything, your body starts to develop not so much a tolerance, but it develops a um, an immune response to it because it gets too much of it. And it says, we don't need this anymore. Like we have enough, like what's going on? Too much of an excess is bad. So it really could be said for anything, like anything could really be inflammatory. Uh, high fructose corn syrup, fructose, extremely inflammatory. Um, some nuts, some legumes are very inflammatory, but again, a lot of it depends on the person. And a lot of times the immunotesting that you do, the IgG testing and stuff like that, 
It'll tell you a little bit, but it doesn't tell you the full story because there's so much going on at the genetic level that we can't really determine. Like we, we don't know, like you might eat almonds and have a level of inflammation that occurs digestively and systemically, and I might not. And we don't really have an honest explanation for it. Um, so it's a tough question to answer. But I mean, there's some things, like I said, like high fructose corn syrup, sugar, uh, high amounts of carbohydrates, developing insulin resistance in the first place is an inflammatory condition. Um, you could go on and on and on. Yeah, yeah, great message right there. You're right. It's, it's individualized to the person. Uh, in my academy, I have a 28-day keto jumpstart. And they're obviously avoiding the grains and the gluten. But I also tell them, hey, let's, let's limit some of the um, high oxalates like spinach and, and yeah. almonds. Just limit it for 28 days. And also the nightshades. And like you said, um, some of those and dairy, I say for 28 days, let's get off the of dairy just to bring yeah. that inflammatory load down. And then we could kind of reintroduce them and see how you feel. For sure. Um, so you talked about you, you discovered keto. Um, what was it? 11 years ago, intermittent fasting and keto. Yeah. Just yeah, about, about 10, 10, 11 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. Way before people were talking about it like they are <laughs> yeah. now. <laughs> so let's talk how, how can keto be anti-inflammatory and then how can keto be pro-inflammatory? Ah, super good question. So, We'll start with keto being anti-inflammatory, just simply from the signaling molecule itself. Okay, so ketones are not just a fuel. Ketones are a signaling device, and probably more importantly than being a fuel. So we, we tend to think in the most of the, the simple like, thought process on the keto community and throughout the keto community is that ketones are a fuel. They're like a macronutrient. They're like a fourth macronutrient. We burn carbs, we burn protein, we burn sort of burn fat, but when we burn fat, we're essentially burning ketones. Well, that is cool. That's a fuel, but the analogy that I've used is looking at ketones as fuel is like thinking Superman is cool because he has a, you know, cool hair. It's like, there's so, okay, it's like, I'm looking at Superman and I'm like, yeah, you're, you do have great hair. That's awesome. But what is really cool about Superman? Okay. And it's the same kind of thing with ketones. Yeah, they're a great fuel. But what's really cool about ketones is the fact that they're not just a fuel, they're a signaling device and they transmit a signal that basically helps reset the body. So when you come down to inflammation, ketones have the ability, beta hydroxybutyrate specifically has the ability to communicate to reduce inflammation. It communicates with nuclear factor kappa B. It comes in and I like to like the ketones are almost like a, if the military were to call in a civilian contractor to come in and help run the show, that's kind of what ketones are. It's like ketones can come in, you look at the military as your immune system and inflammation, where it's like it gets called to action, called to arms when it needs to be. But then these ketones are like a, just a consultant that comes in and says, hey, oh, I'm going to tell you what to do. And they helps modulate inflammation, helps control it. It's like comes in just to the higher powers that it needs to come into and it helps mitigate inflammation throughout. That's one way. And then, you know, of course the other ways is directly at the molecule level is um, very, very similar when it's in the digestive system. Beta hydroxybutyrate is molecularly very similar to regular butyric acid or butyrate. Now, when you look at kind of the phenolic compounds, uh, vegetables and everything like that, they have a very powerful effect at being broken down into, and I know I'm getting complex, but I'll bring it back simply. The vegetables get broken down into short chain fatty acids. For years, we've been promoting vegetables as the pinnacle of health. Well, then all of a sudden we come in and we say, okay, fats and protein essentially could be just as good as vegetables, if not even better in some degree. And when you actually break it down molecularly, they're doing a very similar thing. When we break down fats, when we break down vegetables, we're always trying to break them down into these short chain fatty acids, these little digestible fatty acids that our cells in our gut can eat. Well, Vegetables are awesome for that, but ketones are very molecularly similar to those little fatty acids. So they can essentially be used as fuel too. So we're finding now that ketones are literally gut fuel. And a 2019 journal cell paper showed that there's literally growth. And I know you overuse literally, but that's because I get passionate about it. And it literally does mean that. So literally, if you have a problem with that, you can literally reference it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so people just always bag on me on YouTube. You're over. You're, that's not the real use of literally. I'm like, actually, it is because I won't say literally unless it's literally. Right. Anyhow, but so that journal, that journal cell paper showed that ketones stimulate the gut stem cells to grow, which like, that's like amazing, amazing stuff. So if we are growing gut stem cells, then we are indirectly reducing inflammation because we're protecting the gut more. Long story short is there's two mechanisms. One, they directly communicate with the inflammatory system. Two, they indirectly mitigate inflammation at the gut level. 
amazing breakdown right there. I love the analogies that you give. So what? A, so that's a great way for keto to be anti-inflammatory, help the body heal, get some results. Now, how can keto be pro-inflammatory? How does it do the opposite of that? Yeah. So it, it depends on how you're eating keto. So you talk about like your your 28 day jump start, which I think you're doing just a stellar job with because it's all about being an anti-inflammatory approach to keto, which is everything that I was all about uh, when I first started talking about keto. And the whole purpose of keto is to try to control inflammation. But when you start loading yourself up with a bunch of these omega-6 fats and a bunch of these just low quality oils, you're going to develop a problem. You're going to develop a very inflammatory problem. Within our body, one of the most researched mechanisms of inflammation and anti-inflammation, I guess if you want to call it that, is the consistent tug of war between omega-3s and omega-6s. Omega-3s are the fats that we get from fatty fish, the fats that we get from some plant sources, from grass-fed meat, from good quality um, supplementation even. Now then omega-6s are the fats that we unfortunately directly and indirectly consume a ton of via soybean oil, via um, sunflower oil to some degree. And just, sorry, there's a little banging because they're, they're unloading the trash can, I guess, outside. So sorry if everyone can hear that, but at least you know this is real. Um, <laughs> You know, so a lot of these oils that we consume, canola oil. And when you say, and when you say omega six, you mean the adulterated one, the ones that are already um, rancid, correct? Correct, correct. Because yeah. yeah, there, there is. It's important to know. It's a whole different rabbit hole that needs a whole different explanation. I talk about it a lot, actually. Yeah. So you could go, you could, you could okay. share a little bit. Yeah. So, yeah. Some omega sixes are good. Like yeah. there's, like we need omega sixes, and we need certain prostaglandins, inflammatory responses, to be activated via omega sixes. And then we've got things like conjugated linoleic acid which CLA is a tremendous fat burning, you know, fat and it's tremendous hormone properties and it's technically an omega six. So I don't want people to get the wrong idea. Like there are healthy omega sixes. It's when they're a unstable, but B just in abundance, we're supposed to be having small amounts of these omega sixes. So the simplest, when you're out of balance, you should ideally be at like a one to one ratio of omega three to omega six. Okay. That's what they say on paper. I'm going to talk about that in a second. We as Americans, um, and I don't know how big your international audience is, but I will at least say in the Western, uh, Western world, we're sitting about 16 to 20-ish to one, omega-6 to omega-3. So we're clearly way off. For someone to get a one-to-one -one ratio of omega-3 to omega-6, you really need to be living in like a Scandinavian country or be like a pescatarian. It's pretty difficult. So I would say if you strive for a four-to-one, you're in good shape. Like if you can strive for a, you know, omega-6, four, omega-3, one, I think you're making a really concerted effort and you're going to see a tremendous results. Point is, when you're on a keto diet, you're consuming a ton of fats. So suddenly, that omega-6, omega-3 profile becomes infinitely more important because now what was 10% of your diet before being fats is now 70% of your diet. So it's so much easier for you to, for lack of a better term, screw up and have too much soybean oil, too much vegetable oil. And heaven forbid you have a bunch of these, you know, fat bombs that are being overmarketed right now that are actually made with low quality oils, right? It's like, that's the downside of keto getting popular is just like everything, companies are going to create hyper palatable products that you overconsume and make yourself just as unhealthy in a ketogenic state as you were in a non-ketogenic state. Uh, so that's how we can really end up inflamed. And I've talked to a lot of people before that start out feeling amazing on keto and then three, six months down the line, they feel worse than they did before albeit they lost weight, they feel worse. And they're like, keto's ruining my life. I'm like, no, it's just because you're falling victim to the same exact things that you fell victim to before. You're chasing hyperpalatability, you're chasing convenience, and now you're inflamed. You're just inflamed with fat instead of inflamed with sugar. It's such an important message, Thomas, because uh, I believe vegetable oils are more damaging than sugar, more damaging than even cigarettes in some instances, yeah. because there's a, uh, there's a great book out there. I, I don't know if you read it, but it's called The PEO Solution by uh, Professor Peskin, Brian Peskin. I've had him on the show, and he has a study in there that showed a plate of French fries that were fried in canola oil. So it's not keto, but it was fried in canola oil, resulted in 132 days of cell membrane inflammation. Wow. Meaning five minutes of pleasure, five months of cell membrane dysfunction. So I Holy asked him about God. that. I know it's crazy. And when we, I sat down with him and I interviewed him, I said, I asked him, what's worse, uh, Professor Peskin? Is it smoking a cigarette or eating cooked vegetable oils? And then he, he turned the question back on me. He said, all right, Ben, what do you think the, statistics, uh, the stats are for somebody who smokes two packs of cigarettes every single day for 25 years? What are their chances of getting lung cancer within those 25 years? And 
I said 15%, just guessing. And the answer was 16%. And nice. then he, I know, not that high, right? And then he asked me, all right, what are the percentages of somebody getting heart disease or cancer by eating cooked vegetable oils every single day for 25 years? And I didn't know the answer. And his response was 86%. 86% versus the 16%. So oh, there's, that's a huge, so keto, it is keto friendly. And the thing about it is when we go to vet, well, uh, restaurants, they're everywhere. So what me and my girlfriend do, we, uh, I tell the waiter or waitress, hey, I'm allergic to vegetable oil. Do you have uh, uh, coconut oil or olive oil or butter? And 99% of the time they have a better option. So that's what I do. And I think it goes a long way. Yeah, it's kind of a nuisance, especially when you're in, with the group, but yourself, no. thank you for it, right, Thomas? Yes. Totally. It is so funny that you say that because people think they go out to eat and there's two problems. They go out to eat, they, they make a, a seemingly healthy decision going out to eat because they don't get the starches or whatever. And they still walk out of there feeling terrible. And the next day they feel terrible. Like, oh, I guess I ate more calories than I was like, actually, no, it's just, you just shocked your body with a bunch of just terrible, terrible fats. And that's what's so tough about, um, you know, it's a simple palatability thing like you go to a restaurant they're gonna drench it in an oil because it does make it taste better no matter what it is whether it's a beautiful 75 dollars steak or a you know four dollar in and out burger it's just it just doesn't matter like it's still if it's in that oil like that's what's ha causing the problem like it's straight up it's like i would argue that like if you could probably well okay i'll, I'll take an example like um like in and out burger which really does use actual beef. I mean, some of the other ones are hard. It's a safe example. If they were to actually be cooking that burger alongside just, you know, ghee or lard or anything like it probably wouldn't be all that bad. But what is making that burger terrible is, well, first of all, it's probably grain fed garbage beef, which does have an effect, but it's, you know, they're always slabbing oil on that grill. And that's, so it's just so funny, like context, right? But if you made that same burger, even with grain fed meat at home and you were cooking it clean and you were using ghee or you were you would not feel the same way as you did if you ate one that was lidden with a bunch of vegetable oils and of course a lower quality salt. Like it's so crazy. The same compound, same overall foundational food in two different cooking settings makes you feel like dog crap and one makes you feel great. <laughs> yeah. Perfect example right there. It's, it's such a vast difference between the two oils. So I hope the listeners and viewers are understanding that we want to avoid those vegetable oils as much as possible. Um, I, I'm sure I'm getting them somewhere. I just, I'm not aware of it. <laughs> I'm doing my best <laughs> to avoid them. Okay, let's get into, uh, let's stay on keto actually. I have a question for you regarding keto. What are the three biggest mistakes you see? And you might've mentioned one already. What are the three big, biggest mistakes you see with people following this ketogenic diet? Yeah, uh, it, cha it changes on, honestly all the time. So like someone, someone out there is gonna say, well, you did a video and you said this and this and this a couple years ago. Well, it's because it's always changing. It's always evolving. Um, yeah, the first one is, just like you said, it's, it's the one I've talked about. It's that omega-6, omega-3 profile. Okay. The next one is going to be uh, people freak out too much about protein. I'm um, definitely, and this is one I've had to eat my own words on because back early, yeah, you do. Yeah, yeah. It's, and it's part of being, you know, it, you should always challenge your own hypothesis. Like part of science is always being able to, you, I, you, anyone with half a brain in the scientific community knows that you want to like you want to prove yourself wrong. That's like, that's what the whole purpose of a control, like you're trying to, here's control, here's normal, here's what the general populace thinks, let's prove it wrong. Well, in the case of your own self-experimentation and your own productivity and your own moving forward, you view yourself and your current beliefs as your control and you should always be challenging them because that's how we grow. <laughs> like what I believe today, if I'm doing research consistently to try to prove what I am doing today wrong because that's how I can grow and I can say this worked, this did not. I rest my case on that point is, is that, um, you know, the next big thing, yeah, was protein. So it used to say creating content early on in the keto community, it was all about fats. Why? Because most of the evidence was coming from the therapeutic ketogenic community, which was all about fats and the practical application for 90% fat diets was absolutely totally legit, but it's for people that have neurodegenerative diseases, people that have epilepsy, people that are really needing high levels of ketones. Now, as we see, most of the success of the ketogenic diet doesn't necessarily come from high levels of ketones. It comes from moderate levels of ketones, but more so the abstinence of um, your sugar coming in and the gene activation and the different receptors that activate whenever we are deprived of dietary calories at certain, which we can segue into fasting later on with that. So point is, is extra protein doesn't necessarily cause a problem. 
extra protein, A, takes more calories to burn. So you actually can end up in more of a deficit that way by eating protein calories versus fat calories. But B, gluconeogenesis does not kick you out of keto unless you are consuming an acutely huge amount. Um, in fact, it can actually support it and stabilize it. And spoiler alert, by the time this video, this airs and everything, but like the, you, you, you might've seen on Instagram, I posted up like talking about my little experiment that I've been doing the last yeah. few weeks. Yeah, where basically, I mean, your, your members can kind of get a little spoiler alert on it when they see this ahead of time. But I mean, basically I went periodic low fat keto to kind of test this and doubled my protein intake and went low fat. And it wasn't carnivore because I had increased my veggie content tremendously. Point was, is tremendous results, tremendous blood work. Um, it improved. I did not get knocked out of keto with even 300 grams of protein. So it was pretty, pretty wild. So that is a big, I think a lot of people, so then what happens is they don't want to have protein. So they overeat on the fats. Mm -hmm. And you and I both know, I mean, okay, nine calories per gram versus four calories per gram. It's hard to lose weight when you're consuming nine calories per gram coming from fat. So don't be afraid of the protein. It doesn't mean overdo it. And, and, you know, kind of old school word to the wise, always you know, drink a lot of water if you're consuming more protein, because it's naturally a diuretic and you do want to also make sure you're taking care of your kidneys. Um, don't recommend that everyone does 300 grams of protein a day, by the way, that was for my experiment. And then I have to think kind of about the, what I would say the third, third mistake is right now, because, um, it's, you know what, you know what, I will go ahead and I, I'll say that, um, I mean, it's kind of a common one, but it's when at the end of the day, still getting down to whole foods is going to be the most important thing. Yeah, there's so much processed stuff out there and the act of processing food within the ketogenic world right now that's again, what makes it so easy to overeat. And I don't want to just get on the calories in calories out train because we all know that that's not the end all be all. But at, at the end of the day, if you are consuming a lot more calories because you're consuming something that is delicious and processed, then yeah, it's going to be a heck of a lot easier to overeat. Um, and coupled with that, I think the overuse of artificial sweeteners on the ketogenic diet is probably a big mistake too. Because we're starting to see that it ties in with the process, but we're seeing if people are consuming copious amounts of sucralose, aspartame, and yes, I hate to say it, even erythritol, stevia, and monk fruit, we are seeing potential cephalic insulin responses. And the more, and you, you can reference a study from 1990 and you can see, sure, there's some evidence of a cephalic insulin response, but our bodies and our brains are adapting. And if we are consistently giving ourselves stevia and consistently giving ourselves monk fruit, eventually your brain's going to connect the dots. And it's going to say, oh, this is the new sugar. The point is, is anything that's giving you a big dopamine spike like that is probably doing something negative. Anyway, sorry, I could go on forever in that. Yeah, no, it's, it's great tip. So those the three things that Thomas just shared for the biggest mistakes at this current moment that he sees in the keto community is number one, eating too many of those inflammatory fats, the omega-6, having a dominant omega-6 to omega-3. Number two, don't worry about protein. It's really not that much of a concern like he, he once thought, myself included. And then number three, was uh, these sweeteners, artificial sweeteners. I, say, I see the same thing. And I, I was just on a call with my keto campers and they asked me, you know, what do you think about artificial sweeteners? And I say, well, I know aspartame and sucralose, that's going to destroy your gut bacteria. Let's stay away from that. Then they asked about what about the erythritol, the monk fruit, the stevia. And I said, you know, I think it's fine in moderation unless you're one of those people who have it and you just want more and more and more and you want sugar, you want carbs, and it's just creating that sugar addiction response. Then I, then I say, hey, it's probably not a good idea for you to have it. So for me, I can have monk fruit. I can have stevia in moderation and I'm yeah. just fine. But yeah. somebody else, Thomas, you know, they'll have it and it just opens a whole new door to going in their pantry and eating whatever they see. Yep, totally. And, I, and it's, it's usually quick. And my advice for people with that is if you, if you feel like you have to have something sweet when you're on the ketogenic diet, it's better to have something sweet like stevia, monk fruit, like put in a little bit of yogurt or whatever and have it before bed because then that the cravings that you're going to get from it, you're not going to get them because you'll at least be sleeping. And it's, it's just, if you're suffer with that and you feel like you really need it, you know, do it after dinner, like a typical dessert. Don't have it in the middle of the day. Cause I will, I'm one of those people. Like if I have something sweet, um, like if I have just some of these like keto cookies and stuff that are out there, which, you know, of course we all enjoy them from time to time. But like if I have one in the middle of the day, it's like, I want to raid the pantry 20 minutes later. Yeah, yeah, totally. Great tip. I, I want to add another one. I want to see your thought, hear your thoughts on it. And then we'll transition into fasting. Uh, the biggest mistake I see is there's several, and it always changes, but the biggest one I see is staying in ketosis too long. <laughs> because when we look at the history of this world, there's not one culture in the history of this world that's stuck with the same diet long term. And when I, may, when I say long term, I mean maybe three or five, three or, three or five years or longer. They always adapted by their environment, right? So we didn't have a tribe back then 
who were they were in ketosis because keto is not a diet it's a metabolic process and they came across fruit they came across honey they would feast on that they would get out of ketosis so we know that there's no culture that's stuck with the same diet long term so with that being said the, the way i teach it is keto flexing teaching the body to get keto yep. adapted resetting the metabolism and if you don't have insulin resistance if you don't have type 2 diabetes let's start flexing because i see when people stay in ketosis for too long their results start to really slow down. I actually see two things happen. I see the thyroid T3 begin to lower. And then I also Mm -hmm. see dimply fat occur because uh, the way I see it is the body will want to preserve its fuel source. And if you only taught it to burn fat, it'll slow down its fuel source. So it'll actually insert water to slow that down. So I want to hear your thoughts on that. What do you think about? Yeah. uh, Oh, totally agree. Yeah. I mean, you're talking to someone that, you know, I'll do two to three months keto and then I'll come off for, two to four weeks, you know, or sometimes even longer, depending on sometimes I'm messing around with different goals, but it, it's, yes, you're absolutely right. The goal is metabolic flexibility. And if you are getting your body fat adapted, then that's great. Okay. But that doesn't mean that that's the way that you want to be forever. Okay. You, if you go for too long, you can make yourself glucose intolerant, but not permanently. You'll make yourself glucose intolerant to the point like where, okay, then when you do, and there's a, a cheat, the old cheat meal study, I did a kind of a debunk on it, but it was, uh, you know, talked about how, okay, like you put people on keto diet and then you give them carbs and suddenly their body rejects the glucose and it sends their blood sugar and insulin resist, you know, high sky high. Okay. Well, that's, that is true. And that is going to hold true for a period of time until your body adapts to glucose again. So the point is, is that you should be cycling in and out in my opinion. However, I do think when you first start keto, you might want to give it three to six months of getting yourself into ketosis and truly developing that mitochondrial biogenesis to be fat adapted. Uh, and then after that, all these benefits happen. So it's like, okay, you're fat adapted. So your body's used to running on fat. Well, then what happens if you decide to shift gears all of a sudden and reduce your fat intake and increase carbohydrates for a little bit? Well, the body is going to say, well, I'm used to running on fats. So it's going to say, well, where's the fat? It's going to start pulling it from your body. And there you go. Now, all of a sudden, you just turn yourself into a fat incinerator. It's, so there's metabolic benefits and there's cosmetic benefits that come with cycling in and out of it. And it's all, we are always chasing, we're not doing ketosis to be dogmatic. That's what I'm upset with with the industry is, I would say that's actually a big mistake is like, we're all, but don't be myopic and don't be dogmatic about this. It's not like, we're not here to say that keto is the only way. Keto is a tool and it is a metabolic pathway that allows us to become better people. And if the science shows next week that, you know, ketosis is amazing, but we can use leverage it to, to use this dietary strategy for more longevity, then we need to be open to that. Um, so I'm hundred percent with you, man. Yeah, I know you were. Amen, brother. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Let's talk about fasting. Cause we are running out of time and I have a lot more questions to ask. <laughs> we, talked about, now. <laughs> we talked about keto. No, it's great. It's great. I love when you go into detail. We talked about keto. We talked about the mistakes made. Uh, inflammation. Now let's talk about fasting. Fasting is actually my favorite tool in the Did health it. shed. Yeah, I, I, I could go on and on about fasting. But what are three of the biggest mistakes you see with fasting? Yeah, uh, you probably know the first one because I sound like a broken record talking about it. It's breaking your fast improperly. That's the one time that like, you have, you know, like you have one job. <laughs> do it right. Uh, like when you break your fast, you are so sensitive to what you consume. So if I could just wave a magic wand and help everyone understand that when they break a fast, you should keep it just lean and clean. That's simple. Lean and clean. A little bit of fat's not going to kill you. A little bit of carbs aren't going to kill you, whatever. But lean and clean. Don't go sloppy when you break your fast because you are insulin sensitive as you can be insulin sensitive. Like your body is going to absorb whatever you take in. If you take in crap, body's going to absorb that crap. If you take in clean nutrients, your body will absorb that. Okay. The next thing uh, is going to oh, be- Oh, before, wait, before the next thing. So let's, let's, okay. I want to clarify that because I understand what you're saying. So the worst thing would be to break your fast with a, a, a plate of carbohydrates combined with fat, correct? That's what you're correct. saying? Correct. Yeah. Okay. So you want to avoid that com- combination. You want more of maybe protein and fat or healthy carbs and healthy protein, correct? Yeah. I would almost say, uh, you know, right when you break your fast- if you can keep it to just protein and you break your fast for 60 minutes, like you're, you're in good shape. Break your fast, have a shake, have some meat, whatever, keep it lean. And then 60 minutes later, eat a normal meal and don't be as well concerned with combining fats and carbs and just you know, have, relax a little bit. It's just right when you break your fast, the safest bet is just protein. 
okay, if you're not doing keto, you can have your protein with a, with a you know, low fat carb, like a, a clean carb. Um, you know, I'd usually recommend like a, uh, I usually recommend like a, a potato that's been just baked with nothing on it. It's just clean starch that uh, potatoes get a bad rap, but I mean, potato is going to be a heck of a lot better than a grain than a grain. And it's, uh, you can, you can pick apart any food in reality is, but so bone yeah, then, broth would be an ideal way to break your fast. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah. And bone broth, I, I would say bone broth almost in conjunction with that protein, right? It's like you have bone broth just to kind of support the gut and that way you can get into the nuancey stuff, but yeah, I mean, plain and simple is just clean protein. Awesome. All right. Tip number two, uh, biggest tip, mistake. Tip number two is a very popular uh, question that comes in. Keto coffee or bulletproof coffee will indeed break your fast. <laughs> that's a, that's a big mistake as people are like, well, oh, well, X and X said I could have this. So-and-so said that I could have, you know, coffee with um, coconut oil and butter and that doesn't technically break a fast. I hate to break it to you, but when on earth does like 500 to 600 calories of fat not break a fast? It definitely breaks a fast. Um, and I have a is, question for you. Uh, yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to challenge you a little bit here, okay? Sure. Uh, well, I want to ask you, what is your definition of breaking the fast? So you know, I see where you're going with this already. <laughs> so when you come down to like, what is going to trigger mostly digestive processes, not so much as the calories, because you can argue all day autophagy is occurring at a different level within different cells and different organ organs of the body. So anything that stops hepatic autophagy to me breaks a fast hepatic autophagy so how do you how do you calculate that would you be able to calculate that by t by testing your glucose and ketones before and, and after no not really because no. hepatic autophagy is something that you usually have to get some pretty intense blood work done so you'd have to kind of take a look at um, ampk levels what's actually happening so basically the studies that i've seen have shown that really over 10 calories or so is going to trigger hepatic autophagy to stop basically where cellular regeneration that's happening at the liver level because the liver is getting a break from digesting food would come to a halt after 10 to 15 calories. So that's why I'll usually say black coffee has technically two to five calories depending on the roast and depending on how oily the bean is because it does make a difference. Sometimes if you look carefully at your coffee, you'll see a little bit of oil droplets at the top. Yep. Uh, so when you're adding a lot of calories to it, then yes, you're technically breaking that fast. But you know, you could also argue like, what are you trying to achieve with your fast? And people water fast, people coffee fast, you know, you can go on and on. Yeah. So, you know, I think it's uh, people get frustrated because they watch Thomas's videos. They watch my videos. They watch uh, Ben Greenfield, Ken Berry, and we all have different definitions and, and advice, even though we all kind of um, agree on most things. There's a few things. And then, you know, I'm sure you get this all the time. Oh, but, but this person said that, and you're saying this. Um, so I, I have a question before we move on to the third mistake, because sure. it's relevant to what we're talking about here. How, do you recommend to somebody out there who's starting keto and they want to find the right information? Do you recommend, Hey, finding one or two people and going deep with them? Or how do you kind of clear that confusion or frustration with people who are getting conflicting information out there? Yeah. Well, the shortest, simplest answer is do what works for you. Um, I would recognize, I would have subject matter experts in each area of what you'd like and what you believe in, because you have to go with what resonates with you because that's what you have to remember is the biggest part of any study that's difficult is adherence, is subject adherence. So if you, if someone resonates with me more so on my philosophies for breaking a fast, then maybe I'm who you want to listen to for that part. But if, because it resonates with you, but if someone says something to you that just really just does not seem to make any sense to you and you think that it's going to make you question things, then maybe that's not who you listen to for that bit of advice, but maybe there's another area that totally resonates. The hard part with that is you become a rampant consumer of content in different directions and it takes a lot of time. So if you have the time to be able to do that, that's the best strategy. Otherwise, um, you know, you just have to, maybe you have your fasting expert, maybe you have your keto expert. I have a plethora of people that love me for fasting content, but they don't like me for keto content. And that's just the way it is. They're like, I don't like Thomas's strategy because he's not carnivore and there's a lot of carnivore stuff. Like, right. So like some of the keto community is like, I don't want to listen to Thomas because he doesn't know what he's talking about on keto, but dang, he's good at fasting. You know, it's, yeah, it, you, have to, you, have, you have to go with who resonates with you, period. It's, I know it's, yeah, great point. I love that you shared that. So, so for me, um, I always say water fasting, you'll get the most benefits. Of course, yeah. throwing some electrolytes, but if you want to have your coffee, even if it has some, some calories, uh, some fats, MCT, whatever it is, 
I say, hey, test your glucose. Uh, let's see what's happening. Test it right before you have your coffee and fat. Test yep. it 30 minutes later. If I see your, your glucose go up more than five points, then by my definition, it's negating some of the autophagy or a lot of the autophagy yeah. and it's breaking your fast. And that's, I base that off of Dr. Thomas Seafree's research when he's given glucose and then the tumors actually grow back and then he gets yeah. them back into ketosis and he gets that max autophagy and they, they start shrinking. So that's my definition, right? But like you said, find the person who you will resonate with most and that's the person you should uh, follow or, or just, you know, at least in that specific um, category. So totally. I, I love it. And you know, we don't have to agree on everything. That's the whole, the whole reason here. No, that. it's, and it's such a, like, it's such a new space at the end of the day. Like, I mean, the research is just fat. Yeah, sure. There's some fasting research that's centuries old, but I mean, realistically, like we're just, we're all learning this together, you know, and there, everyone has a different way of translating it and explaining it. And that's what resonates with people. I mean, my, the only reason my following's big is because I think I, I break it down in a simple way. I'm, I'm certainly not the person that's doing the cutting edge stuff. I mean, they're, I, I stand on the shoulders of giants to be completely honest. I'm just good at explaining the information. <laughs> yeah. Amen, yeah. brother. So what's the third mistake with fasting? Uh, this is one, hopefully you'll agree with me on this one. Cause I feel like this is a big emotional one is people get addicted to it. Hmm. Um, way too addicted to it to the point where I think they, they get their, I mean, it's, we're okay to have cal caloric restriction. And yes, there's a lot of longevity attributes, there's a lot of longevity benefits that come from caloric restriction, but I see way too many people developing a binge and purge type mentality where they get so addicted to fasting to the point where they go out and they eat something bad and they feel like, well, it's okay. I'm just going to fast after that. And I just don't want that to be the mentality because fasting should be healthy. We should not be doing it to deprive ourselves. We should be doing it to a hormetic response to challenge ourselves and make ourselves stronger when it becomes a deprivation game or a punishment game that's just a terrible psychological spiral to put yourself into and you'll find that it just it, you end up fasting every day and the next thing you know so it's the kind of the logical um, evolution that would happen is everyone wants to just push more and more and more i see people start with 16 8 a couple of days per week and then they move on to 16 8 four or five days per week then they do 16 8 every day which is to some degree okay depending on who you are and then they say well I'll, i want to keep pushing it more so i'm going to do a 24-hour fast each week in conjunction with that then I'm going to do a 48 hour fast. Ah, oh, screw it. I'm just going to fast for 72 hours every week. And it's like, next thing you know, you're like, you look, how many calories are you actually consuming in the week? You know, like, sure. We, I know there's breatharian, breatharians and all this stuff that people that like will fast, but is that your mission? Because I will tell you that there are cellular processes that need to occur that require food. So I always take fasting with a grain of salt and try to like, I go through, I will go through periods a couple of weeks where I won't do any fasting at all simply because I feel like my body's in, I need to capitalize on that mTOR phase that my body just is thriving for at that point in time. Um, and a lot of it depends on like just stress levels and things like that. Like I don't recommend people fast when they're under chronic, chronic amounts of stress because you're, you, at that point you do tax your adrenals. Um, a different story for a different day, but you know, fasting is stress on the adrenals, which is okay because it's adaptive. But if you're already stressing the adrenals to the max and then you push it, another thing people ask me all the time, should you fast when you're sick? No, you shouldn't because your body, it doesn't work like that. Like your body is in demand. Your body has called the army. Like, so you're going to deprive it of weaponry. Like you should be training your soldiers, your immune system ahead of time so that they're efficient when they do get sick. But when they do get sick, give them the tools that they need to fight. So it's um, people are like, oh, well, I'm going to fast this virus out of me. No, you're going to lower your core body temperature so that the virus can't die. And then you're going to wonder why you're getting sick it's, or getting more sick. It's, it's and, you're very, not, and you're not saying to feast when you're sick. You're just saying no, you no, don't no, deprive no. yourself from the, from the nutrients you need to get better. Yeah, yeah. there's studies that show you're going to have a higher protein demand. So I usually recommend increasing protein when you're sick. But again, story for another day. Yeah, awesome. Well, we have four minutes to go and I have my <laughs> rapid fire questions. But you, you, made a great, you made a great point because you said there is a balance between mTOR and autophagy. And that's where the art is. I mean, if you can master that, you're going to be in the right direction. You don't want yeah. too much uh, fasting or too much mTOR. It's that, that sweet spot right in the middle right there. So I love that you do days where you don't fast. I recommend the same thing. Okay, you ready for the rapid fire questions, Tom? Let's, let's do it, man. What is your favorite keto food? Oh, man. Uh, off the top of my head, asparagus. <laughs> nice. What's your favorite non-keto food? Ooh, um, tamales right now. Mm. What, <laughs> Good gluten-free tamales. Yeah, gluten. I, I agree with that. 
What is the first thing that you think of in the morning? Uh, is my kiddo okay? <laughs> that's, that's always, he's in the other room. So I'm always thinking like, I wake up, is he okay? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Like a, like a true father. What's the best piece of advice you've ever heard? You know what? I got to give it to, uh, actually, I'm not going to disclose where I heard it because it's, it's not important, but it's important to drive yourself not to be driven. Mm. Let that sink in for a little bit. Mm, that's good. <laughs> yeah. What's the worst piece of advice you've heard? <laughs> Don't lose yourself along the way. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty st uh, silly. Yeah. Um, what was your favorite TV show growing up? Oh, man. Um, what age? Because <laughs> I would say Rugrats as a little kid, Doug as like, uh, you know, when I was like yeah. nine, 10 years old, and then it transcended into uh, probably, probably uh, SpongeBob, I would say. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> Still like SpongeBob. <laughs> for me, Rugrats uh, for sure. Yeah. And then Friends. I, I really loved Friends yeah. going up. All right, we're done with the rapid fire questions. Um, I'm gonna ask you one more question and then we're sure. gonna, I'm gonna hit pause on this um, Zoom recording, but don't exit yet. Stay on, cool. on board no real quick. Uh, 150 years from now, they're looking back at your work. Maybe you mm -hmm. have written many, many more books. You have thousands of videos on YouTube. You have this um, plethora of work you've created to impact the world like you've been doing. What are they going to look back and say about Thomas DeLauer 150 years from now about the work that you created while you were here on planet earth? It's a good question. I think they're going to say something like try to be really like humble and not say something odd, but I think they're going to say like, okay, well this, this guy did a really good job of leading the masses to, to research and really being able to teach people that there's more than just what, big industry and what the food industry wants to show. And I, I, I really, I can hope that they're going to say, this is one of the guys that really led the charge against just food marketing and just big industry in general. I mean, cause that's really what it is. But out of all of it, I think that I want to be able to be the guy that arms people with the knowledge for them to make their own educated decisions. And so sort of this mission to empower everybody. And that's what I want them to look back and see. Um, Assuming 150 years from now, everyone has the actual ability to physically watch videos. Yeah, right. because it's probably going to be some like holographic thing. But assuming that if they can figure out some archaic, like um, obsolete piece of equipment to watch my videos, you know, they'll probably say that in the voice. Like, hey, he has pretty cool biceps. Too. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Great answer. Okay. So where would you want my audience to go look up your work? Although I'm sure they already do, but where's the best place? I think, you know, YouTube's obviously where to go. Uh, ThomasDeLauer.com is you know, there's a little bit more there. Um, you know, there's stuff on, um, I don't do a whole lot in the way of like custom training plans and stuff anymore, but occasionally there's an opening. So I got, that's there. If people are that interested in that, um, you know, also I, you know, really been trying to drive a lot more traffic over to Instagram lately, not because I'm like moving away from YouTube, but because Instagram gives me an ability to be a little bit more myself and less high production. Uh, YouTube is a production game. It's not, not my nature to be vlog style on YouTube and I built a brand surrounding that. So if you want to see like more of like, Hey, what does Thomas like typically eat in a day and what's his family like? And what does he do day to day? Instagram is the place to follow me for that. So I highly recommend people check that out. Cause this is a different style of content. So that's just at Thomas DeLauer. Super simple. Awesome. Yeah. We'll put his, uh, your Instagram handle in the video here and we'll also put all your resources and links down below, uh, the podcast and the YouTube video. Thomas, you are amazing my brother you are doing what you just said people are going to look back and say that you were you did because you're empowering so many people to ed you're educating them and empowering them to do their own research and break through all the noise out there we know there's a lot of sick people who are tiptoeing their way through life and you're helping wake them up man and i admire your, the work that you're doing i was saying this before we got on here I, I just admire everything that you do because you show up every single day and i gotta tell you it takes a lot of consistency to do the things that you're doing to make the impact that you make. So I appreciate your work. I look forward to seeing what you're going to create next. And I look forward to more collaborations with you, Thomas. Thank you for your time today. Thanks, man. Likewise. <laughs>